Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and this is Tom Evans. Tom is an author, musician, poet and technophile who specialises in helping people and businesses tap into their creative muse and today we're talking about his new book, The Art and Science of Lightbulb Moments. So welcome Tom. Hello again Joanna and welcome back to the UK. Thank you so much. <laughs> And it's great to talk to you again, and we've been talking for a couple of years now, and it's brilliant to see this this new book you've uh, got out there. So maybe you could start by telling us a bit about, you know, what is a light bulb moment anyway, and why should authors care about it? Well, that's a, that's a great question, yeah. Um, light bulb moments are these, these uh, gems of ideas that you get. They, they sort of tend to... Um, come against the creative, the normal creative flow or the normal thinking process. You know, that internal dialogue that we run all the time where we might be thinking about something that's just been said or thinking about something we're going to say. And all of a sudden, a great idea comes in. Mm -hmm. But they tend to come in in less than a second and they come in fully formed. And when you get a really good one, you get really excited about it, your gut gets involved and your heart falls in love with it. And if you have one in the middle of the night, then you've got to get up and just kind of write it down. So it's this, this blinding flash of inspiration. I guess the mo one of the most famous ones is St. Paul on the road to Damascus, isn't it? Mm. Or the apple falling on Isaac Newton's head. So it's that brilliant flash of in inspiration that uh, seems to come in no time at all, comes against your conscious thought stream, and then you've just got to do something about it. And so how do we get into the right headspace uh, for these moments? You know, like at the moment I've just arrived in London, I'm on the London Underground, there's people, you know, rushing around. Um, I, I don't find that very inspiring. You know, where is the headspace for these types of moments? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Well, a lot of people, there's, there's, there's lots of ways of creating them. Uh, some people have them in the shower. And there's, <laughs> a, there's, there's kind of a reason why the association with water and, and us creates um, light bulb moments. It's a slightly esoteric reason, but it does work. So instead of just going out in nature, being next to a waterfall, getting in the shower, that can work. Meditation's great, obviously. But as you say, if you're commuting, how do you, how do you meditate? So uh, there's, there's other ways to do it. You can uh, do uh, mind mapping, which is absolutely fabulous. You can do, uh, do what Edison did, which is you just come up with idea after idea after idea after idea, and you just hope that one sticks. Um, I do something which is slightly more subtle than that. I just set out every day with the intention that I'm going to have the most amazing serendipity and, uh, and then something just appears because of it. Uh, or the other thing you can do which works really, really well is just collaborate with somebody else. You know, So get into that space where you're working with somebody else uh, on the issue and their objectivity might just give you the, the seed that you need. They might just say one thing. They might not have the light bulb moment themselves but they won't say one thing about the thing you're working on and that gives you the thing, that's it, that's brilliant. So there's a number of ways of doing it. You know? mm. Meditation's the best though. No, that, that's great and, and for people I guess, you know, and whenever I talk to you I go, I must meditate, that's definitely something I must do mm. <laughs> and um, I'm not very good at that type of thing but you mentioned mind maps there, that's more what I do. Also like collaboration even with events like I went to Paris and went down the catacombs and got ideas from that. Is that kind of what you mean, you know, ref refreshing your creative soul, I guess? Yeah, and if you get into that kind of space, I mean, that, that kind of space, that, which is a catacomb, it's got a lot of energy inside it, so you can be picking up on all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things in there. But, yeah, just getting away from, I guess, getting away from the normal pattern, right? So if you're in this, let's say you're doing a commute, nine to five, you're going exactly the same way to work, right? Mm -hmm. A very simple thing you can do is get off the tube a stop earlier and just walk in a slightly different way. Look up if you can as opposed to looking down because if you're looking down then that puts you in that internal thought mode. If you look up watching for paving stones and things like that then if you look up it puts you and you look up to the right it puts you in that frame of mind where ideas can come in and as you're walking along somewhere different you might spot something different that then gives you that seed. And meditation isn't about sitting in a dark room with your you know, you're doing this sort of mudra sort of thing with your, your legs crossed. It's just getting into a quiet me space. Yeah? And so I meditate every day, whether that's a dog walk or actual uh, formal meditation. Mm. No, that's fantastic. Now, some people talk about receiving ideas or the, the muse being some kind of other entity. Um, you know, what do you think about that and how can we get in, in touch with that, I guess? 
Yeah, well, I use a lot of models in the book to describe this, and Carl Jung uh, describes this uh, concept of the collective consciousness. Mm. Uh, and it's the sort of thing that, you know, when the phone rings, you know exactly who it is, or your dog knows you're about to come home. It's, it kind of describes that kind of phenomena, really. Mm. And the idea is that at some, in, at some level, maybe at a multidimensional level, which is a bit quantum physics-y, um, we're all connected, and that all thoughts all memories and all future memories, future thoughts, are stored in this collective. And somehow we're all wired into it. And the, late, and the quantum physicists are kind of, kind of joining up and, di- and converging at the moment with the, the spiritually minded and saying, yeah, well, actually, this thing called the zero-point field that we talk about, which is kind of fifth and sixth and seventh dimensional, could be the mechanism whereby we tap into that. And our brains, you know, they say there's 90% of our brains that don't know what it's for. It could be that 90% is in fact the transducer that, that taps into the collective consciousness. Hmm. And I guess, you know, in the book, you do talk about a lot of these concepts, you know, the Ak- Akashic field and chakras and, and, and stuff like that. Do we actually have to understand all of that stuff in order to, you know, manifest these light bulb moments and practically get creative? Not really, because uh, um, the, these things are just all models. They're all models for us poor humans to try and understand why we're here. Mm. You know, so so the chakra system is really uh, can be described in other ways, and and uh, people with MRI scanners now are finding that there are um, c- collections of ganglia and neurons at these points. So they really do exist. You know, they found that there's more neurons in your gut, in your in your your solar plexus chakra, effectively, and your sacral chakra than there are in a cat's brain. And it seems to respond, you know. So this is a real sort of entity, if you like, inside our in, inside our bodies that we can tune into. And uh, you know, we, we've done it many times, haven't we? Where we've uh, we've not trusted our gut, and then we've regretted it later. Mm-hmm. And so we have this intelligence inside us that we've kind of, as we've grown our conscious mind, we've kind of ignored, and uh, sometimes to our our peril. So so chakras, uh, whether you call them chakras or or, or set, sets of ganglia. They're all real things. Now, even and, and actually, I've, I've uh, spontaneously over the last few years developed the ability to see them. But even though I can see them, that's still not only subjective, and it's not proved that they exist. But imagining that they do exist seems to have a great result. Mm. Absolutely, and, and you know, writers, we use our imagination, that's what it's about, so that, exactly. that, that, that's fantastic. Now, what I love about you, Tom, is you are, you know, you're kind of that wizardy type person, you, you have the metaphysical, but you also get into the practical, and it's not all about, you know, metaphysical stuff, is it? What are some of the practical ways we can take these light bulb moments and make them into something? Okay, so... so um... Well, the first thing, I'll just sort of just backtrack a little bit, because before we start talking about chakras and things like that, there's something we can all do better that's really, really simple, that is better for our health and also is one of the generators and the fuels for light bulb moments, and that's to breathe deeply, and that's to breathe with our diaphragm, and that's the fuel that actually gets us into this mode, and we all, we all breathe very, very shallowly, and our neurons don't store oxygen, so just by breathing better, we actually put more nutrients into our neurons, we call, cause more neuronal activity. So, but once you've had the idea, um, what happens is, the idea is, and I've described this in the wrong video, it comes out of the superconsciousness through our crown chakra, which is just the model, sometimes it comes through the back of the head, through the cerebellum, and it filters into our conscious mind. At that point, if we don't do something, it, it can leak back to the superconsciousness and someone else can pick up on the same idea, which, which kind of explains why you never had a great idea and you've done nothing with it, and then two years later you say, someone else has nicked my idea. Well, it was everyone's idea, just they tuned into it at the same time. If, however, you ground it and you bring it into physical reality by writing that book and starting to write the book, it, it seems to have the effect, and this is just um, subjective from my perspective, it seems to have the, the effect of pulling it out of the superconsciousness for a, for a time where you can just work on it and making it kind of, a, I call it sort of karmic protection. Ka- karmic rights management as opposed to digital rights management, if you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the main thing you've got to do is got, you've got to bring the idea down and then you've got to act on it by putting that pen to paper or, or writing that first chapter. Mm. 
No, absolutely. And uh, you do talk about actualizing and you have a lot of, um, I guess, exercises in the book where people can, can do these types of things. Um, and we talked a bit about mind maps. Why don't you explain a bit more about that and how that is a tangible way of, you know, putting that subconscious stuff into writing? Yeah, well, mind maps are great because uh, you know that we've got this left and right brain. And uh, this was kind of discovered in the 60s that, that, that there seems to be different functions uh, in left and right brain. And they, they originally did all the research on left and right brain uh, based on people that had some sort of trauma uh, or mental illness. And what they found is by severing the connection between the left and right brain, they could cure epilepsy, for example. Or when they get a stroke victim, they can find out which part of their body is impaired and then work out what bit of that brain is for. But nowadays what they can do is they can anesthetize brains temporarily. And they can make us like whole left brain, the whole right brain. And really, in, in healthy people, say, like, I'm just going to switch off your left brain or a very small part of your left brain or right brain. And they can see what part is impaired. And what seems to be happening is that they seem to find that the, we've almost got two minds. We've got a left brain, which works in space and in time and almost uh, creates the physical universe around us, but in a collective way. And we've got a right brain, which is tapped into everywhere and everywhere else, which is this super consciousness area. So if you get the left and right brain working in harmony, bearing in mind when I was 40, a psychic told me that I've got 110% left brain and zero right brain. And at the moment I work a lot with people that are the other way around. And the techniques in the book help dyslexics and help you balance the brain. But the mind map is the best tool ever for getting the left and right brain in sync. And the way it works is this, is that the left brain goes, brilliant, a map. I do the maps around here. I do the navigation, so let me do the maps. Now, the right brain goes, brilliant, left brain is busy. And while the left brain is busy, it gets in and gets fully creative. And then what happens is that the, um, the, 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 the map itself, we start with a central idea, which might be for the book, or it might be for a chapter or something like that. And then we branch out radially uh, with associations, word associations, picture associations, and you get completely random associations that take you into a brand new area that you wouldn't have gone into otherwise. And this pattern of the mind map mimics the neuronal pattern inside your brain. It's the way our brain is wired. So it becomes very memorized. And what I do, if I'm ever doing a talk, I mind map the talk first. And then I, I stare at the mind map for 60 seconds, but defocused. It completely goes into my visual cortex at the back of the brain. Mm. And then I can remember the whole talk without having any notes. But importantly... I notice coincidences around things in the map as well. So you become very lucky around the map. So if you're writing and you've mapped the whole of your book, then what happens is you notice coincidences better and you think, oh, blind, I can use that in my book. I can use that incident that happens in my real life in my book. Or I was working with a lady the other day and we were just looking around the room. Uh, well, I was doing a coaching session with her. I was in this, this hotel in, in Guildford and I was looking around the room. I said, look at that statue over there. Look at this bell here. Uh, and then the guy came over with the with the tea and coffee, and I said, "What's your name?" And he was called Igor, of all things, right? And all these things in the room were just brilliant plot devices for a book, and the book was kind of assembled by the physical reality room, which is great. Mm. And we put all this on a mind map, and then she ran me up yesterday saying, "I've just got all those more things now." Yeah, and I, I find that too. The moment you think of one thing and then you write it down, that in itself can become the centre of a whole new mind map, can't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got uh, the, the new um, Tony Bazan software does this, uh, got a great new feature called Child Mind Mapping, which is absolutely superb. Mm. Yeah, no. I love that. And I should point out to people who are listening who aren't aware of, you know, what you get up to. Um, you do have to talk, talk about all this stuff, but you have so many practical tools and you use a lot of technology yourself. So um, I, I want to encourage people to not think that it has to be all woo woo or all technical. It can be uh, a combination of both, can't it? These tools can help us in, in a spiritual way. Yeah. And uh, well, for example, when I'm doing my creative writing classes, then I ban computers from the class. It's all pen and paper, or pencil and paper, colour pen and paper. Uh, and, and some people, when they put a computer in front of them, it can flip them back to left brain mode again, mm. just the very fact they're working on the computer. Obviously, uh, that's one good thing about things like the iPad, is that you can retain in, in right brain mode while you're working on the iPad, because it's, it's very intuitive, if you know what I mean. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to work with people that... I've, I've worked with uh, several people that can't use computers. They do everything on pen and paper. Mm. Uh, and some people uh, are severely dyslexic, they record their stories and then get them transcribed. Mm. 
and yeah. Mm. No, I'd like, actually want to ask you about that. It's branching off a little bit, but um, you're you, you're so multifunctional. I would really like to be able to speak my, you know, my thoughts a lot better in in mm. um, you know for, for writing. Do you have re any recommendations on that? I mean, it's kind of a light bulb pro process, but you're expanding on it in words rather than in a mind map written down. What do you think mm -hmm. about that? Okay, the, the real key to using your your voice box. To speak anything like we're doing now is to is to really breathe and if you breathe now use it with, with the diaphragm not only do you pump prime the neurons in your brain but you activate this point called the throat chakra right and it makes the flow from brain to chakra throat chakra really clear same if you're doing public speaking and that sort of stuff you know really breathe deeply uh, several times using the diaphragm and it pump primes the whole process and when people hear you, they'll hear it in the recording as well, mm. which is really quite important. Mm. Um, and you know, you can you can um, you get a different story when it's spoken than when it's written, because you're using different bits of your brain for that process. Mm. So it, it kind of it, it's kind of good if you get stuck to maybe speak it through. Also, it's a really good technique for proofreading. If you read your own book out again and you find that you're stumbling over a sentence when you're reading it out, then people, when they read it just visually, internally, will also stumble over that sentence. Mm -hmm. And if you find that you're reading a sentence out, and especially with dialogue, and you're pausing for breath, that means the reader, inverted commas, when they read it, will be struggling for breath. So speaking words is kind of a very, very good uh, tool for uh, all writers to do. Mm. If you do it properly, of course, you get an audio book and a printed book at the same time, too. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, because we, we don't really use all of our faculties, do we, as writers? And, that uh, you know, we don't use our whole bodies. And I guess your book is a lot about bringing more faculties into creation. It's about using any faculty, I guess. It is, yeah. And remember, that the, book, the book's not just about writing. It's about ideas. It's about if, you, if you're in business and you want... Uh, if you're in business and you've had a great idea... But it's not going very well. It could be that you want that, that you want to do to spin it off and to come up with different ideas with it, or you might want to collaborate with someone else that can help you get the, the thing out there. Sometimes the blocks that you come across as well, which we we'll talk about in the book, mm. are uh, pretty, pretty. I found this out when I when I started getting involved with writers. Every writer's block I came across was a life block, and so what we do was we all would get a win-win situation because I'd clear the life block and clear the writer's block at the same time. But it manifested itself as a as a writer's block. Mm. And quite often, uh, the person that had been they had been brought to the writing project, kind of unconsciously knowing it was something that was going to um, help them grow and evolve, mm. which is quite significant. And the same can be true in business, especially if you see repeated patterns in business where you get, you know, you're let's say you got close to the sale three times and never quite made the sale, then it's a, it's a telltale sign there's something wrong somewhere in the process that with a small tweak, you'd be really successful next time. Mm. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the second half of the book is all about then all these practical things you can do. The first half of the book is how you get into the state where you have light bulb moments, and the second half of the book is then when you've had one, what do you do with it? And there's lots of little tips in there, like um, you know how you can collaborate inside a business, how you can collaborate outside a business, and how you can go through and identify the blocks that you might be coming across and mm. deal with. Absolutely, and uh, we did another podcast on blocks and clearing writer's blocks, so if people are listening and you want to go and check that out, I'll put a link in the recording, so in the recording notes, so people can go to that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I wanted to ask you as well about, uh, you mentioned this sort of seasonal um, thing in the book about creative seasons and about seasons for different things, phases of the moon, that type of stuff. Maybe you could talk a bit about that because I think that's incredibly valuable and sometimes we struggle to create and it's actually just the wrong time. Yeah, we can just be pushing water uphill. Well, if you think about, the, the, think about the, the earth and how it revolves around the sun and this sort of stuff. There's, there's three natural cycles uh, before we start going into cycles that go over thousands of years. The, the natural cycles are the daily cycle, and, and I'm really creative in the morning. Mm. So I know that if I'm going to do writing stuff, I'll, I'm best between 10, uh, 8, 8 and 11, and that's when I'll write my, my the next chapter or the next article or something like that. And so I switch my phone off, I switch Twitter off, I switch Facebook off, and all that sort of stuff. 
And guess what? By not being on those platforms, less noise gets generated because we are generators of our own noise. So I worked for a daily cycle. I've also noticed uh, about two or three years ago that there seems to be a moon cycle. I came across a book by uh, um, a very interesting chap who described this lunar cycle. And the way it works is this. Astronomically, as the, Earth goes around the, as the moon goes around the back of the Earth, full moon through the second quarter, it goes past the Earth in space and it pulls the Earth slightly faster in space than it has been moving before. When it goes around the back of the Earth from new moon to first quarter, it slows the Earth down. So the Earth sort of lurches around the sun. Right? This is an astronomical fact. So I just have this theory, well, maybe what we should be doing, is as, as the moon is coming past us, we should be pushing whatever we're doing. And as it goes back the other way, we should be contemplating. And I've tried uh, phasing my marketing efforts to the moon phase, just as an experiment for two or three months. And it worked amazingly well. And then I found a book that, that you can actually, found something else where you can actually divide it into quarters and do different things at different times. And that's really well. And I actually, actually developed a, a, a program called Riding in Tune with the Moon that, that, that works to this thing, which is just fantastic. <laughs> Then about two or three years after writing my first book, I sort of reflected on when, what I've been doing. I noticed that all my books, I wrote them in spring. Mm. So we like springing forward. Mm. But I was thinking about them all year, but the main, write, the main writing activity was always in spring. And so what you've got to do is tune in to different phases. Some people are great in the evening. Some people have got uh, kids, jobs, all sorts of things to worry about. So there will be natural times when you're more creative. And if you're not creative, don't give yourself a hard time. Just say, okay, I should be more comfortable with it. I should do some research in this space. But don't give yourself a hard time just because things aren't going well. And as soon as you sink in with your natural phase, you just become more effective. Mm. No, I like that. And um, I would separate the creative spurts. So, for example, I had a massive thing around the catacomb trip, uh, you know, a mm. few weeks ago. And, you know, wrote down loads of ideas. And that was very creative. But the actual writing a chapter I think is more about discipline and getting sitting down and doing the work now right. do you see that separation between you know ideas and actual writing writing well I guess what I guess after a while it becomes kind of ingrained and you don't think about it anymore and I'm like you that if I've got if I want to write something I just write it now mm. yeah and I don't, I don't think, oh, what, what time of the month is it now? Am I ready to do this? Not the blokes, we'll talk about times of the month and that, but, but I think, should I be writing today? So I don't, I don't limit myself if something's coming through. But what I do do is if the flow is not there, I don't give myself a hard time over it. Mm. Yeah. And then sometimes you look back and say, yeah, I'm trying to write this under pressure. Uh, I'm just not, the flow is not there. Give yourself a break. Sleep. Well, if you don't have good sleep, it's not good either. You know, that can really disrupt your creative flow. Uh, and then the other thing you can do, of course, uh, and I've written a chapter in the book about it, is you can use your dream time to write, a, write in inverted commas, a chapter of the book. So, you know, then really sort of use just your 24 by 7, seven uh, ability to actually bring in ideas while you're sleeping, which is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And you get better ideas then, because in the same way meditation makes the conscious mind go quiet, obviously when you're asleep, uh, largely the conscious mind is, is put to bed literally. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, with many of your uh, books, Tom, you take a lot of ideas from all over the place. I mean, you, you have a huge you know, ability to take ideas and distill them down. And, and it's a very dense book. Um, I actually, you know, I, I had the ebook version and I bought the print version because I want to oh, thank you. <laughs> digest it more slowly because it's, it's full. It's really dense. So mm -hmm. I want a very difficult question for you. Um, one takeaway for people uh, from the book that uh, if you know if they haven't got it yet what, what one thing would you like to tell people about the book okay very very simple and this is really simple it's about breathing right so if you do nothing else just think about breathing and breathing has two parts to it it has the inspiration process and it has the expiration and aspirational process right in the still point between the inspiration and expiration is when the ideas come in now, people don't think about this either, but we don't, we can't speak on an in-breath. So what happens naturally is our ideas come in on the in-breath, and if you breathe in, uh, the, the magnet is coming at the back of your spine on the in-breath and breathe out as if it's coming out the front of your body on the out-breath, at the still point between is when the ideas come in. And if you pay attention to your thoughts, 
again, uh, running them against the pattern of breathing, then uh, you start to tune in to the ones that are coming from that collective consciousness. And if you think about the word inspiration, it's in hyphen inspiration. Right? So it, the word gives away the clue of where the ideas are coming from. And our bodies are an inspirational receiver and an inspirational generator. Marvellous. And um, I, I, I can paraphrase that as the consume-produce model. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which I, I definitely believe in. Okay, so where can people find you and your book? Books, well, I've got, got a brand new website, which is uh, www.tomevans, that's T-O-M-E-V-A-N-S dot co. That's not a dot com or a dot co UK, just a dot co. Got loads of stuff there about the books. Got a download section with free uh, audio where you can get into this meditative state. They're le all 11 minutes long. I make all my recordings really simple. You can download them for your um, your PC or your for your, your, your MP3 player. And it's really, there's two there. One, how to uh, get into the zone by energising left and right um, uh, brains, which has got a little nostril breathing thing in it. And, um, and, and then a fantastic meditation on how to quiet the mind, which is also very good. So they're all free. Uh, so it's all at domems.co. And the book's available everywhere? Right, right now, yeah. I took a little picture today. I have my iPad the printed book and a Kindle, all with the book on it. I took a picture and shoved it off on TwitPix. So you can get it for everything. It's available for the Nook, uh, and there's all, all platforms, and um, all the links are on the, on the website. Uh, if you just put the art and science and light moments into uh, Google, it's amazing. There's pages and pages of it now, which I'm really pleased about. So. <laughs> right, well, thanks ever so much for your time, Tom. That was great. Always great to talk to you, Joanna. Speak soon. <laughs>